Hi, Melissa. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm so excited to, to dive into our conversation today. So I'm here with my friend Katie Hope, and um, we have known each other for a little over a year now, really gotten to know each other. And I thought she would be someone so amazing to have on the podcast just to share her experience, her journey, what she does for a living. I know that our listeners will get so much great information from it. So I'm so thankful that you said yes. Oh, thanks. I'm I'm excited to share whatever information I have and hopefully it will help someone out there. Yeah. Well, and I told Katie, I was like, we just kind of go with the flow. So I don't send you like prescripted questions. We just kind of see the conversation and see where it goes and just intuitively feel like what needs to be asked and said. And it's been working out really well so far for the 20 episodes. So I know this one is going to be great. So I would love to dive in and just, you know, start with your journey to motherhood. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you being a mama. My journey to motherhood. Um, I always wanted to be a mom ever since I was little. Uh, I know that's not everyone's calling, but I definitely my whole life, like just couldn't wait to have my own kids. Uh, and so I did. I had my first child when I was 25, um, and now he's 22 out in the world, which is, seems insane. Um, and I have three children. I have a beautiful daughter, Morgan, and I have a, my youngest, Shane, and I love being their mom. I yeah. really do. Um, yeah. How old is Shane? Shane is uh, 17. He just turned 17. So seven, so, ranging from 17 to 25? Uh, 22, but yeah. 22. Why did I say 25? Yeah, I, I, I was 25. 25 when I had like, me. You did say 25, but it was when you had your first was when you were 25. And I always, pe people often ask me about um, how I got into birth work. And, and I said, you know, when I had my first baby, I didn't, know anything about anything. <laughs> and I, I consider myself blessed that I just, I wasn't afraid of childbirth at all. I've been raised with like, oh, you go to the hospital, you get your epidural, you have your baby. It's easy. Don't worry about it. Um, and I found the experience more challenging than that. <laughs> okay. So that's sort of what led me into researching, exploring other options and other things. But, um, yeah, it just becoming a mom at 25, which I now think is young. At the time, I thought I was all grown up, but now I'm like, oh, you could have waited a couple more years. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it changed me. It changed everything about my life. It changed my perfect per perception of things. And um, I'm still learning. It's always a work in process. Yes, absolutely. It totally is. Now, did you, so it sounds like you were, were like me, like I always wanted to be a mom and I thought, okay, I'm going to have my kids in my early twenties and then I'm going to have the perfect house with the perfect white picket fence and perfect marriage. Like, did you follow those same lines? Like, you know, were, were you married? Like, did you had your first? And then it sounds like shortly after, like you had another one and then another one. Is that kind of, did you just like pop them out girl? <laughs> Well, I love, I love that you had a vision for perfect. Like perfect has never been in my vocabulary. I've always been a little uh, chaotic and go with the flow. So I knew that would be my life. Um, I was married. Um, it was intentional. That was so shocking to me when I went to the doctor's office. Like I was so happy to be pregnant. And more than once was I asked like, Is, are you okay with this? I was like, yeah, I did this on purpose. Like I was ready. I was ready, but I yeah. was to them, I was young, you know? Yeah. Um, and I thought I wanted four and I, um, I sort of, I think it's good to know yourself when you go into motherhood. And I knew that energetically, like I wanted to have my children young. I just, that's how I chose to do it. Um, and I got pregnant with my second a little sooner than was maybe on my timetable but I still wanted more children. Yeah. Um, and 
then my my third child was like really planned. That's when I really was coming into my own as a person. And I, my, had my values were clear. And I was like, absolutely, I want to have another baby. And I had this incredible natural water birth with him, which for me was something I wanted to experience. And I just remember looking at his like beautiful face and my, and my beautiful birth that had just happened. And I was like, thought to myself, I have managed to have three healthy children um, and my health is intact. And I think I'm just going to say thank you to the universe mm. and could call us complete. Yeah. Wow. That's so beautiful. I would love, and I think the listeners would love to know too, especially because you said, you know, your idea of what pregnancy was and delivering was you go to the hospital, you get epidural, that's how you have a baby. And then by the time you had your third, you were having a water birth. Like that is so incredible. So can you talk about that evolution of like, how did that happen? Was it somewhere obviously in between that you kind of discovered that there are other options out there? Like, how did that happen for you? Sure. Um, so when I had my first child, I, I knew before birth or I thought before birth that I wanted an epidural, but I wanted to be educated about the process. I didn't know the process. So I did take a Lamaze childbirth education course which was informative, but I sort of, um, I took it lightly, you know, like, I don't really need to know all this. The doctor is going to take care of it. The nurses will take care of me. I had a supportive partner. Um, like it'll just be fine. Um, and now as a childbirth educator, looking back sort of historically, it was fine. Everything was fine. You'll hear this mantra toted around the birth world of healthy mom, healthy baby. But now after working with people for 20 years, I'm like, we pay the most for our healthcare but than any other nation. It's like, that's your low bar. Like that's your minimum that we should hope for. And we're actually not doing that great at that. Yeah, like, but we should ask to be respected in labor and listened to in labor and taken care of in labor. So I'm in labor with my first child on my due date. You know, I'm so excited. I feel like, oh, I'm so like I'm on it, I'm doing great. And then I had what I tell people was like my first real contraction. People can't see me air quoting, but it was like real where I felt it like my knees buckle and I was like, oh, that's different. <laughs> and um, I tried a few techniques that I could remember from my class. And then I was like, mm, that's it. I'm ready for my epidural. Thanks. Thanks for playing. Yeah. And I got it and it was effective. But I really like the nurses watch from the monitors, you know, out in the lobby and they check in on you. My doctor, who I thought would be there the whole time, they come in as the baby's coming out. Like they are really last minute. And I was sort of overwhelmed with this sense of abandonment and aloneness and uncertainty. I didn't know what was next or what was normal or what was happening. So when he was born, physically, I, I felt like a train wreck. Like I felt like I had been beat up, which confused me because I thought the epidural was going to protect me from all of those feelings. But actually when you birth the baby, like there's still the aftermath. Like, I don't think we talk enough to moms to be about postpartum and what that looks like and what that feels like. And, um, then everything else, how your life changes at home. And so I felt really overwhelmed at becoming a new mother. And so when I got, I call like, I call it like blessed pregnant with my daughter. <laughs> um, I immediately was like, I got to figure out a way out of this. Yeah. Like that, my sensation was panic. Like I want this baby, but I, I don't want that labor. I don't want to do that again. Yeah. So I started researching and I came across a video of a woman in labor who had a doula, a word that I had never heard before. Um, and the, for those listening, a doula is a paid private labor assistant. So they go with you sort of as a coach for your lab labor and an advocate with you and your partner. They don't replace the partner um, to, to help you and your partner navigate labor. 
And in this video, the woman, she must have been like six, two. And she just lifted the laboring woman out of the bed and like wiped the sweat off her brow and was like, you can do this. You've got this. And I was like, that's what I needed. I yeah. needed somebody to lift me out of the bed and be like, you are okay. Let me help you. Yeah. Um, and so I hired a doula and with that baby, I still delivered in a hospital, traditional hospital. Um, but with my doula, with my husband at the time and with a midwife in the hospital. Okay. Before that, I didn't know you could use a midwife in the hospital. I thought they were only for home births and only for natural births, but that's not true. There's a lot of midwives that work in all traditional um, medical settings and they are amazing. Um, and with that birth, I had a really difficult birth with her, but afterwards when she was born, I still felt so much better about that experience than I did with my first labor. Yeah. And, and I was like, there's really something to this. Um, shortly thereafter, a good friend of mine was having a baby and she was like, if you could only take one thing with you to the hospital, what would you take? And I said, absolutely a doula. Wow. And, <laughs> and she's like, what's that? And I explained it to her and she said, well, would you be willing to come with me? And I said, I'm not a trained doula, but at that time I was a massage therapist. I had now had two children of my own. I'd witnessed birth. I said, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll try. Yeah. I'll come with you. And I, I always say people have two reactions to watching a live birth. They either think it's the most amazing, miraculous thing they've ever seen, or they think it's gross. They want nothing to do with it. Right. And, and I fell into the first camp. I was like, that's amazing. There was two people in the room and then there was three. And it changed me. I went immediately out and uh, became a certified doula with uh, Doulas of North America with Dona at the time. They're now um, Doulas International. And yeah, that was it. I never looked back. Wow, that is incredible. And I think, um, could you talk a little bit about, because I think it would be helpful for you know women that you know maybe are pregnant or haven't had kids at all. So there's like, uh, a OBGYN. So there's a doctor that can deliver, there's a midwife that can deliver. And then as a doula, you're not delivering your, can you deliver? Are you um, just a partner in, in, you know, the delivery process? And then the, there's a midwife and a doctor potentially there. Like, can you explain potentially like the difference or the differences maybe between what a doula is versus maybe like a midwife? Cause I would love to, I'm like curious myself. Sure. Absolutely. And I get, I get that question a lot. So um, OBs are obstetricians or midwives, and there's two kinds of midwives. There's a, a certified nurse midwife, um, and then there's a lay midwife. Okay. And so nurse midwives have um, a nursing degree as well as their midwifery license. Um, lay midwives still pass the same exams, still have the same um, background knowledge, but they are not technically nurses. Okay. Um, so lay midwives almost exclusively work at, as home birth midwives. Okay. Um, and a doula doesn't do anything medical. So a, an obstetrician or a midwife are in charge of your and the baby's health. They make sure everything is going well with you and keep everyone's health protected. And doulas are more there as, um, for physical and emotional health and education. I like to use an analogy whenever I can. And I love the image of a Sherpa, okay? So if you wanted to climb the Himalayas, climb a mountain, you are gonna do the walking. You are gonna climb the mountain, but you hire a Sherpa who is a local guide, who's been to the top of the mountain many times, who knows the language, who knows what to bring, who knows when the weather looks bad and it's time to like turn back or take a pause to help keep you um, safe and encourage you on the journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's what a doula does. So then you are keeping them safe and encouraging and helping them along their journey to delivery. And so then do you, can you do that in a hospital? And then can you do that at someone's home too, like with a water birth? 
Sure, I do that in any birth setting. And in fact, I'm, I am mostly work in hospitals because in the United States, most women still birth in hospitals. Um, there are also birth centers, which I think is a great in-between for people because birth centers provide a location where you can labor and um, it's for people wanting natural childbirth, but also it's typically like a little bit closer to a hospital. They have more supplies on hand and they provide comfort for some people who might not want to give birth in their own personal home, either because they live very rurally or because they have other children at home or yeah. too many animals, you know, for many people being at home provides the most comfort and the most relaxation for some people, the thought of having other people in their home, yeah, is like too too stressful. Yeah. So wait, did you backtrack? So your third, you it was a water birth. Was that at your house or were you at a birthing center? I was in a hospital. You there in a hospital. are hospitals that have tubs and water birth. It is um, safe to have water birth. Many people think that possibly it's unsafe. It's not. There are. Um, practice in, is in place to keep it safe. Um, people are often shocked and unaware that birth really depends on the hospital in which you give birth. It is not the same in every hospital, in every state, and across the country. Like it really varies hospital to hospital. Depending on like, so do you mean like depending on what they offer? So if they have a water bur a water area or a tub, or if they like push for you to have um, a C-section, not push, but like if they recommend more of those or what do you, so what do you mean by it's different? Cause I would think that it's all the same. It absolutely isn't. And that's something that's really interesting about being a doula is even sometimes nurses and doctors, if they always work in the same hospital, assume that that's what birth looks like everywhere. But hospitals can create their own policies. And so what is considered safe in one hospital, they never do in a, in a different hospital. And so um, I was very specifically speaking of um, having tubs available to birth in. Um, when we were talking about my particular birth, because that's not something that's offered at every hospital. But honestly, you asked a better question, which is statistically, the number one indicator of whether or not you will have a cesarean is the hospital that you decide to birth in. Wow. Um, and the C-section rates vary hospital by hospital. And by law, you're supposed to be able to call your hospital and ask them what their C-section rate is. Oh so that's so good to know. Wow. I had no idea. So you could call the hospitals closest to you and ask what their C-section rates are. And you could also speak to your um, provider, your OB or midwife, and ask them what their C-section rates are. And I always say, if they get really nervous when you ask what that number is, then that's also a good sign that maybe that's not where you want to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. And I, so going back, I, um, so when I had my Jackson, so my oldest, I went into the mentality, well, I don't know what to expect. So I'm going to do my best and, you know, try to have a natural labor and, you know, see how it goes and just be open to, to doing that. Because I had the mentality of that's what a good mom does. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that's your body's supposed to be able to do that. So I should be able to have a natural birth and be fine and go with it. So I labored forever. I did it at home. Then I went to the hospital. My husband was doing all the things. Like I was on the ball. I was in the shower, like massaging my back, all the things. And I was so uncomfortable. I just couldn't even relax. And finally I was like, you know what? It does not make me any less of a mom. If I decide to get an epidural, like my body, I can't even relax right now. Like I wanted, I literally, when you said that earlier, like with your second one, how you were like, how do I get out of this? Like, I literally was in labor and I was like, how do I get out of this? Like, how, how does this not happen? How do I tap out? Like, I was like, I'm, I'm done. Um, I can't right now. I can't even think. And I, I haven't even started like actual labor. And so when, as soon as I got the epidural, 
I was able to relax and like, he was born shortly after. And I was like, you know what? There's nothing wrong with me. Like I did my best and I wasn't dilating and it just, you know, there was nothing wrong with me. And I think that is such a mentality um, that it's so individual, you know, with like what your thoughts are, what your training is, like what you want. But I think also making sure that you have people around you that give you all of the options, I think is so important too. And I had no idea that hospitals, you know, were, were different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love to say to people, if you don't know your options, you don't have any. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really true. And um, I, I want to speak to two different things that you said. The first was that sensation of like, I don't want to do this. Um, there's a period in labor that they call transition. It's typically towards the end of labor when you're going from seven to 10 centimeters dilated and it can be the most intense part of labor towards the end. And for people who are, are having, um, instead of natural, sometimes I used to, I like to use like an unmedicated birth. Because okay. you're not, you know, people get touchy about the word natural, you know what I mean? Or vaginal birth, you know, it's still, it's all birth, cesarean birth. I love to say cesarean birth instead of cesarean section. You know what I mean? Like you're still giving birth. Right. It's right. just in a different way. Um, but so many people in transition when they're having unmedicated birth say, I'm leaving, I'm not doing this. And of course, it sounds crazy to everybody else in the room, but it's like a very natural and normal thing. Um, but, you know, my response in, in the gentlest way I can to people is the only way out is through. Yeah. Like we just have to go through the experience. Um, and yeah, there's no such thing as a good mom or the right way to give birth. There is just... Um, I want all women and all people giving birth to feel safe and tended to and cared for in birth. Um, sometimes in many ways, I feel like people who have cesarean birth, like that's so brave. It's so brave. You are like literally choosing surgery and like handing yourself over to protect this being that you've never met before. I mean, that's such an incredible, to me, sacrifice to people. Um, but like, yeah, I do a lot of education for people that doulas are not just for people seeking unmedicated birth. I absolutely work for people who know they want a plan to have an epidural at some point, or they know they're gonna have a cesarean section uh, birth, but I almost feel like the more medical birth you have, you, you can rely even more on a doula because what I'm there to help facilitate not only information, but is like comfort and calm. Sometimes I'll call myself your insurance policy because you don't know, you don't know what kind of birth you're going to get. You might want an epidural, but guess what? Sometimes the anesthesiologist is not available yet. Sometimes your labor is going so fast there isn't time. Sometimes it's going so slow. They say, you know what? It's really too early for you to get your epidural. You're not even really in labor, which I hate it when they say that to women because women are like, I am definitely, <laughs> I am in labor. Yeah. Um, but there's comfort measures that you can use to help keep you calm and relaxed. You know, as you talked about getting the epidural and then your body was able to relax, that's really how, partly how I'm acting for people wanting an unmedicated birth. I'm the epidural. I am getting them to calm and relax so that their body's own natural hormones, own oxytocin can rise. And it, that actually gives pain relief. Like when you are having unmedicated birth, if you can lower our cortisol levels, it's called the hormonal cascade. If we can calm ourselves down and relax, then our own natural pain relief can take over. And so do you mind, like, what are some things that you, you do to help women, you know, calm themselves or their mind or their breathing? Like what kinds of techniques, um, trade secrets do you, do you have that you use as a doula to, to help women do that? Because I know you go through classes beforehand, but then when you're in that moment, 
you know, you don't, you don't know. And your spouse, they're trying to help you, but they just, they don't want to see you in pain either. You know, they're like, whatever you want to do, you know, it's your body, but what kinds of things do you use in that moment? Sure. I mean, I have a long list. Um, I'm sure you do. <laughs> things that I use. Um, I massage is a great one for people who enjoy massage. Not everyone is the same. I love a good massage, but um, so if that's something a person enjoys, particularly, I teach a lot of my um, support people how to do a good hand and foot massage. You have millions of nerve endings in your hands and feet. And just focusing on massage of the hands and feet um, can really calm people down, lower people's blood pressure, help their whole body to relax. Um, I'm a huge fan of hydrotherapy, which is a fancy word for water. So that's where tubs come in, but also showers. Like if you have a really hard day or you're not feeling good, a lot of people instinctively are like, I'm going to take a sh hot shower. Or I'm going to take a bath and just relax. It's a hundred percent why it works for labor. And the shower, when you take a shower, you're also getting the sounds. So you're getting that white noise in the background, your whole body, the muscles relax around you. And so often the labor is still as strong, but your perception of the labor is, is calmed down. It's less painful. Mm. Um, so those are two of my faves. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I know. And so I totally feel the massage because I love getting my feet massaged and I just got a massage mm, last week or the week before. And I've been having issues with like my feet and I'm like, I know they're the whole reflexology and stuff like that, but I know it's diet. I know it's got to be related to something else that's happening in my body, you know? So I'm like, oh, if I'm having digestive issues, like, oh, when she touches a certain point, I'm like, what's that connected to? And she's like, oh, this is digestion. And I'm like, it makes sense. Like why that part of my foot is hurting. So I could totally see how that can help soothe, um, you know, in the moment, some areas. I didn't realize the hands though. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And another thing, when we're people are in labor, what it's a very primal experience, right? Like our body is just doing it. And we need to let the birthing person stay in that zone, you know, where they're just in their body and breathing and relaxing. And there's um, a tendency of partners and husbands in labor to ask, what do you need? What can I do for you? What do you want? And in that moment, you're actually asking the person who is struggling to solve their own problem. <laughs> it's yeah. not, it's well-intentioned, but it's not helpful. And it puts your brain into problem solving mode, which you want to let go of. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking the birthing person what they want, what I say is offer something. Here's some water. Or, um, let's try getting up and doing one of those lunge positions and see if that helps where you're telling them that's what we're going to try. The, the woman in labor will tell you no, <laughs> if they don't like it, if it doesn't feel good, but then you're offering something for them to try instead. Mm, yeah. That's yeah. It's just like that play on words. Whereas like, instead of asking a question, it's like, here, here's a suggestion. Um, yeah. And I'm sure the woman is very vocal, like, yep, nope, not going to happen. <laughs> not getting up, not lunging. Who do you think you are? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I love this. This has been really helpful and eye opening to so much just that I, I mean, and I've had two, I've birthed two children, have an older stepson. So, you know, three kids in general, and then, you know, through my sister and my brother has kids, but um, I never really had heard much about a doula, or maybe if I did, I didn't really was like, oh, well, that's not for me, or it's not something I need, or, you know, your doctor isn't necessarily going to suggest it, um, you know, necessarily uh, to be like, oh, this could be helpful for you. So this is really, really great information, because I think information is so powerful for women. And even if it's you're done having children, it's great to know for other moms or, you know, when you have grandkids or whatever, nieces, nephews, like all of these different people, it's so great to have this information so that you can share it 
um, information is power. Yeah, and I'm just gonna say too, be COVID, which we've all just lived through and experienced or are living through. Um, again, it varied hospital to hospital, state to state, if they would let doulas in at all. So I've done a lot of um, not shifting my business, but just making people aware, you know, besides the doula work that I'm a Lamaze educator and I do virtual consultations where people can sign up for a virtual call with me and we can explore whatever topic is important to them. Like I can coach them on strategies for labor or a lot of times people have questions about postpartum, about breastfeeding, where I can really fill in the gaps for them if they haven't gotten it from their care provider or they feel like there's conflicting information. That's the number one I thing I hear from um, pregnant people is that our friends, our family, and the internet is full of conflicting advice about what we should do or shouldn't do or what's safe and not safe. And so I really try and just base that on evidence-based medicine, not my agenda. I never have an agenda for people that they should be trying to have a natural birth or they should be trying to breastfeed. It's what can you tell me about the pros and cons of breastfeeding? What can you tell me about um, the benefits of a natural birth? And I just display it as information, not as anything. There's no judgment from me ever about what you choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you talk for a second? Um, maybe we'll talk about you and your life. I don't know, but this is sure. so interesting to me. So you'll have to come back for a second episode. No. Um, but can you talk a little bit about postpartum um, and maybe what that looks like or kind of what you've experienced maybe with some of your, you know, whether it's yourself or with other women that have kind of gone through it and what you see and you know, if there's any, any tips or advice that you have for that? Cause I know, especially gosh, if women have been having babies these last two years and then not being able to be around other people or have access to people as readily, I would think that it could have potentially been even worse the last couple of years. I'm not sure that's maybe just a hunch, but, um, if you could just talk a little bit about, about postpartum, cause I think it can probably vary in so many different ways. Um, and what it looks like. I don't know if you can just shed some light maybe on that. Sure. And you know, your listeners can't see my face right now, which is like, I get sadder and sadder look on my face as you're asking the questions, because of course you're absolutely right. I think it's, it's never easy, but it's definitely harder during COVID because we need support. And, and I think in this country, just just in the nature of our lifestyles, most people are getting less and less support. Um, and with COVID where we're trying to protect infants, right? Cause they don't have the vaccination isn't an option for newborns and, and germs in general are not great for newborns. <laughs> They're still developing their immune system. So during COVID, I mean, we have grandparents that hadn't met their grandchildren you know, um, which makes me sad for everyone involved. Um, and the other thing is that, um, you know, sometimes we'll, people will talk about postpartum depression. And I think there's a lot more awareness around that now, but really the term that people are using are, uh, is postpartum mood and anxiety disorder. Besides disorders, there's many and depression is part of that, but anxiety is real too. And I think in general society, not even think, I know, <laughs> statistically um, our rates of anxiety and depression amongst the whole population are increasing. And that's the number one risk factor for having postpartum anxiety or depression after you have a baby. Okay. And the resources are getting thinner and thinner. Um, something I try and talk to my education clients about and my and my virtual clients about is making a postpartum plan, is having those conversations with your partner and your family before you have a baby to make up, um, to know your risk factors for anxiety, depression, and also like, how can we try and avoid that? Like what support can we have in place and what's our plan? 
Um, you'd be surprised how many people have babies and bring them home and don't really know quite what they're going to do for childcare. They don't have a conversation with their partner about division of labor of uh, who is going to do what tasks, how we're going to make like sleep a priority for everyone because uh, it's important um, to in terms of meals, like preparing as much as you can in advance and also talking to your family and friends, like how involved do you wanna be or not be? You know, it's every family is different. So some people are blessed to have, um, you know, four or more grandparents involved who want to supply meals or who want to come over and hold the baby while you take a nap and a shower in the afternoon. And some people are single parents that go home to an empty house with nobody else to rely on that need to go back to work at six weeks and are just struggling day to day. And particularly with COVID, weren't getting any face-to-face -face support. There is something different. Um, I don't do it, but there's something called a postpartum doula which is somebody that you hire to come and doula you through your new motherhood, typically the first six weeks, but people can use them often for the first year, um, who come over and help you again, sort of like a paid substitute if we don't have those family and friends uh, able to be there with us. Now, of course, that's a privilege you know, and it's something that not everyone can afford and have, but it's a, it's a lovely option to support um, people um, that's out there that people don't always know. Yeah, I didn't even, I think, think it's brilliant that you do like the postpartum, like questions and conversations, because really you don't think about those things until you're in the heat of the moment a lot of the time. And then maybe you're not in the right state of mind to have those conversations because maybe you're at your wit's end or you have hit your breaking point. I think that's really smart to be having those conversations about, you know, sleep, meals, like cooking, cleaning, like who can come over and help, who can just hold the baby. Because I know when I had my kids, I thought like, oh, I can just do all that. Like I can just do everything because I'm the mom. Like that's, that's just what I do. I take care of the baby. The baby needs me. I'm breastfeeding. Like nobody else can do that. Nobody can substitute for me. Um, so I think that is that egotistical, but it's also very smart because then you can get very burnt out. And um, gosh, that is so smart. Darn it. Darn it. Where were you 15 years ago for me? You know what, Melissa? I think too, though, it falls into that trap that you talk so much about, which is being like a good mom or being the superhero, we think we should be able to do it all. We think we should be able to breastfeed without a challenge and and comfort and soothe our baby. And you know, you have you have multiple, you have three children. Like I have three children. They are so different and they are born different with different personalities and temperaments. My first child, I tell people, he didn't sleep for five years. I was so tired. Wow. And then when I had my daughter, she slept like so peacefully, like right out of the gate on this like very even cycle. I used to stare at her waiting for her to wake up. I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> you know? right. um, they're just different. All children are different. Yeah. Well, and I think also, you know, motherhood, like you're different at that phase too. Like when you've had one child versus another child, you're obviously older and you maybe you're more experienced, but maybe your situation is different. Now you have another one at home. So, you know, you're trying to breastfeed, but then maybe you're stressed because then you have a toddler running around or they're not, you know, so it's also, you're different in every stage of motherhood and having a child where the situation isn't always the same. And so, yeah, I am really big on that right now is dropping the super mom facade because I think, you know, and I mentioned all the time because I think that's how I thought, like, this is what a good mom does and I do all the things and I can do them all well. And then you're just falling apart because you're not, no one is able to do everything super, right? And you think that you, you think that people are and they're really not. Um, and it's what's happening behind closed doors or, 
you know, not happening behind closed doors. And so I'm really big on that right now is dropping the super mom facade because no one can do it. No one can do it all. And you shouldn't have to, and you shouldn't have to put that pressure on yourself to think that you have to. Absolutely. I actually experienced something with my first that I've now realized is common amongst people is I felt very guilty about not being a good enough mother to my firstborn anymore. I sort of felt like having the second baby, I had betrayed him and I, because I was less available to him. So again, like I really try and talk to people um, while they're pregnant about feelings and thoughts they might have and try and, you know, cut them off at the past. Like you are not doing anything wrong and, and give them tips and ways to encourage like their toddler or their other children to participate in the newborn experience instead of um, focusing on taking anything away from them. Right. And it's not like they're not replacing you, you know, this is just an addition to so somebody fun for you to play with or help take care of, or just to have enhancing your life, not replacing you as a kid. You know, I'm sure there's all kinds of things that you could go into then like with the kids and stuff too, but yeah, all those emotions are really important. And I do think, you know, when you have, like, I wanted to wait. So a lot of my friends, like when Jackson was born, a lot of my friends were having their second like when their kid was like two, like right in that, like, you know, they were getting pregnant kind of in the one year and then having them when they were like early twos. And I was like, I'm just not ready. Like, I'm not ready to like give up my time. And I just, I just felt mentally, like I wasn't ready to birth again, or just like have another baby or carry a baby. Like I just wasn't ready. And I think it's really important as a mom too, is just to realize your body and your timing and your life and your situation, that it is your unique situation. And it doesn't matter what everybody around you is doing. Like it is your body and it is your situation. And no matter what is happening, like, then that's right. Like if the timing is right for you and you're ready to have a baby or ready to try or whatever the situation is like, but that's okay. Like it's your path and no one else's. Absolutely. And I've worked with people ages 14 to 49. You know, there's no, there's no right time. There's no right way. There's, there's just sort of curiosity and self-reflection of what's important for you. You know, I think that's something lost in maternity care right now is that a lot of times providers will assume that everybody wants an epidural or that everybody's going to breastfeed, you know, and there's no everybody. There's, there's specifically you, like what's, what's important to you and your family. And so um, getting people to uh, ask themselves those questions and to, to write it out, you know, to write down like, in addition to healthy mom, healthy baby, if you got to cherry pick two or three other things for your birth experience and for your postpartum experience, what would those be? Because you can't do it all. We're not, there's not going to be a perfect scenario. But if we know the most important thing to you is that you have your mom there with you when you give birth or have music playing as you give birth. Well, those are things we can, we can focus on and give you. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Is there anything, um, cause I am like, oh, I just looked at the time and I'm like, oh, we could like, whew, we could be here like all day. And we were like, I feel like we just got started. I'm like, oh my God, how have we been talking this long? I don't, I'm like so intrigued with everything you're saying. Cause you know, I'm 44 and I, and I have delivered two babies and I'm still like, Oh my gosh, there's so much. And which I, which I think is great too, um, you know, that things are evolving and hopefully, you know, I know there's still so many people that have never heard of a doula or what that is, or that there, you actually have choices. Like you do have a choice and you have to be your best advocate. Um, I think is so important. Like, you know, yourself and this is your labor. So you need to do what's best for you and that you do have choices, but is there anything that you haven't shared or that you want to share or like, 
last notes on like, this is something I really believe in, or maybe you've talked about it all. I don't know. Um, no, I've never talked about it all. There's always more. <laughs> um, I just want people to know that they have the right to say no, thank you. That just because there's a hospital policy or in place, this or my favorite is, well, this is a, like our standard policy or this is a routine procedure. You can say no, thank you. You are a grown adult. You have autonomy over your body, over your baby. And so if they are trying to, if anyone is trying to pressure you into um, doing a certain test, procedure, uh, birthing position, you can say no, thank you. Mm, I know I'm like, I want to dive deeper. I don't know if we can dive deeper, but I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what kind of, like, what are you talking about? I don't, uh, you know, I guess I'm very curious about that. Cause I'm like, what do you mean? Like if someone, cause you, I also feel like, well, that person is not, they're more educated than me, or this is their, this is their field. So if they were offering it, then it should be something to my benefit, right? Is that not always, I don't want to say that's not always true. Like they're trying to do something that's not good for you, but I guess, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like, I'll, saying, I'll give you a sh- so, sure. I'll give you a quick example because I'm, I'm watching the time, which is what you wear in a hospital to give birth. It's standard to have you put on a birthing gown. They like you to put on a birthing gown. You don't have to. You can wear your own clothes. I feel more comfortable in my own clothes than something that other people have worn. <laughs> um, okay. And there's, there's some science behind it. Like psychologically, like they're trying to make you, that's why we put the military all in a uniform. So you're all the same. It, it creates like an emotional detachment. And like, I, I don't want that. I want to be attached to my birth experience. The hospital needs access to your arms in case there's an emergency. So they could give you medication or IV fluids. Well, that's okay. I can wear like a little nighty or a lot of people wear a sports bra and like a skirt or, or nothing like that's also an option for people. Um, the hospital staff just wants to know that if, if it gets to be a mess or they have to like cut it off of you, it's like some crazy scenario that you don't care. Um, but some people feel pressured to put on that hospital gown. And to me, that was disempowering. I needed to feel for my natural birth, I needed to feel as powerful as possible. And what that looks like for me started with wearing my own clothes. Mm, okay, that makes more sense. Cause I was like, I don't understand. Cause I probably have been like that where I'm just like, yeah, if you're suggesting it, sure. If that's standard, okay, then why wouldn't I do it? I mean, there have been times when it, intuitively you're like, but for the most part, it's like, oh, well, if you're recommending it and this is what you do, then sure, why not? Have at it. I and I gave, you, I gave you the safe example. We could have gone say, into yeah. medical stuff, but I, we only have a few more minutes. So I stuck yeah. with that. But anybody, I could be happy to dive deeper with anybody who'd like to uh, inquire. No, I think that it's so important. Yeah, because it is. It's like my mentality, maybe other people don't think that way, but it's like, well, these are the professionals, like this is their best practice. This is, they know better than me, but it is also, like you said, it is a you experience. So it is my experience, not this is everyone, but this is my experience. So what's going to be best to make this the best situation for me and my birthing experience or my visit or whatever it may be. So, and I think that's important probably for anything you know what I mean? Like any kind of appointment or any kind of practice or anything that you go through is being, you can also say no, or you can say, I'd like another opinion, or I would like this, or I'd like to find out more information first, please, you know, and being that advocate for yourself. I like to remind people that you might be surrounded by experts on birth, but you are always the expert on you. Mm -hmm. You're always the expert on your personal health on your personal experience and you need to be able to vocalize that in a safe and respected way yeah oh i love that all right so here's how we're going to wrap it up i love to ask this one last question um we as women do not celebrate ourselves enough so my friend katie what is something that you love about yourself right now 
I love how brave I am. I have made a lot of decisions in my lifetime that have seen sort of outside of the box. And it doesn't mean I'm not afraid. I am nervous and afraid a lot, but I have really, I think, come into my own where I try and always act out of bravery. Like this is worth it to me to, to choose my own path. Mm, I love that. You are definitely brave, my friend. Um, where can people find you? Cause I know that many listeners are going to want to find you for themselves or maybe recommend you to someone that they know, or just find out more information. So how can people find you? Sure. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, um, all at Delaware doula, um, and website. My website is www.delawaredoula, which is D O U L A dot net. Um, and all my contact information is there. Cool. And I will make sure I put that in the show notes too, just because it's too hard to write all that down. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It's such a great education. It's just a great learning experience. And I know that so many listeners will find such value in this. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. This was great. Oh, absolutely. You are fabulous, my friend. You are fabulous. <laughs> Bye. Bye.